Good evening. Good, evening. Good to see all of you this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for these that have come this way, Lord God. And we just pray your blessing on this evening as we continue to study your word, Father. We lift up those on the prayer list, Lord God. You know all those needs. You know the needs that are on our hearts that are not on the prayer list, Father God. And we just ask that you would move and touch and meet all those needs according to your honor and glory, Father. We thank you so much for all that you provide for us again, Lord, for your love and for your blessings. Help us tonight, Father. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Real quick, uh, to remind everyone before we get started, uh, this Saturday, October 9th, from 10 to noon, uh, there'll be a, I guess we call it a celebration of life at um, Rock Springs Church from Michael Maddox. And um, so if you're able to make their family will be there. I believe his wife's coming up. Miss Carolyn will be there. And just a uh, time to get together with the family and uh, meet with them uh, to share memories of Mike. So again, that's at Rock Springs Church this Saturday from 10 to 12. Also, uh, this Friday uh, at 1 o'clock, uh, Miss uh, Eunice Bining's uh, funeral will be at the Ford Stewart Funeral Home, and that is in Jonesboro, and it will be at one o'clock. Uh, the family will have visitation from 11 to one at the funeral home, and then they will have her service. So again, that's Eunice Bynum. Uh, her service will be at one o'clock this Friday at Ford Stewart Funeral Home in Jonesboro. And um, they have, uh, you should have got a text uh, showing that information, but it is posted uh, on their website as well. If you need any of that information, I've got it here, and uh, you can take a look at it. All right, if you have your Bibles tonight, if you will open to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And while you're opening there, I'll again remind you, ladies, October 11th at 6.30, you'll be having your meeting. October the 20th, that's Wednesday, we'll be having our final business conference of the year. And then we will be having a singing on Sunday morning, October 24th, with appointed quartet. And so just keep those things in mind. All right, Acts, chapter number one. Last week, we looked at verses one through 11, and... Uh, we kind of tied those in with the book of Luke, uh, showing how Luke just continued this, uh, this description of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we're getting into the start of the church. And uh, so we tied some of those verses in together. And uh, we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ gave his final instructions. And then he ascended up into heaven. And so tonight we're going to take a, a look at the rest of chapter 1. Of the book of Acts, we'll be looking at verses 12 through 26, and we'll see uh, what goes on after Jesus again ascends to heaven. Remember, as we finished last week, there were a couple of angels that appeared and said, hey, uh, why are y'all looking steadfastly? Uh, just as he went, he will come in like manner. And we looked again at the passage of scripture in Revelation. So tonight, we'll pick up with chapter 12, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 12. Now let's read the scripture and then we'll uh, discuss it for a few minutes. Uh, verse 12 says, Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples altogether. The number of the names was about 120 and said, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and attain, obtained a part in this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language, Akeldama, which is the field of blood. 
For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Therefore, these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. And they proposed to Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so the Bible tells us again here that immediately they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called Olivet, uh, and it was a Sabbath day's journey. So just so you know, a Sabbath day's journey is approximately 2,000 meters or three quarters of a mile, because I, y'all like me, y'all know all this meter stuff. Um, you know, I, I, they, I tried to learn some of it, but I just never really grasped it. So it's about three quarters of a mile, and and um, again, we don't know that this was a Sabbath day, but they're just saying it was a Sabbath journey where Jesus ascended was not that far. Uh, from where they were going to return. And so they returned, and it tells us that when they entered, they went into the upper room where they were staying, and then it lists the 11 disciples. And so where is this upper room? Now there are a lot of possibilities. This is possibly the upper room where the Last Supper was held, and uh, they just went back and continued to stay at this place. Uh, this may have been the upper room where after Jesus was arrested and died on the cross, they went and hid themselves. If you remember in Luke 24 and in John chapter 20, you can go in and read. Remember, they were locked in the room. They were scared that they too, maybe at any time, were uh, going to be arrested. And what happened? Jesus suddenly appeared in the room and uh, spoke with them. And then if you remember, John tells us that... Uh, that Thomas was not there, but he came later on, and Jesus again appeared to them. And um, it's possibly that room. Now, all it may all be one in the same room. We don't know. The Bible doesn't specifically lay us out. In Acts chapter 12, we read that uh, the church was gathering uh, in uh, John Mark's mother's house. And so maybe this is the place they were gathering. So there's a number of possibilities, but they gathered together in this upper room. Now the only difference with this gathering and previous gathering in the upper room is they're not hiding. Again, as we mentioned a moment ago, uh, when they went, were in the upper room after Jesus was crucified, they were hiding, they were scared, they were terrified. This time they were not. They were not hiding, they were not scared, they were not terrified. Now the book of Acts here tells us that they just went back to the upper room, but again if we go back to Luke, and look at Luke chapter 24, verses 52 and 53. It says, They worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. And so this time there's joy. Last time there was fear. This time there's joy. They return. And so what's going on? We know that they're going to be having a prayer meeting in here. They're spending time together. But they didn't spend all that time. Luke tells us that they were going to the temple. And so you know, they would spend time at the temple rejoicing and praying God, praising God and worshiping. And then they were gathered together as this young group that was going to become the first church. And they were doing what? They were having prayer, and they were uh, unified in that prayer, seeking uh, for the Lord to come. Remember, they were told to wait, to go and wait. And so uh, here they are in the upper room. Uh, we find out about the 11, and then in verse 14, it goes on and says, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers and so they continued in prayer they were uh, with one accord in other words they were in unity they all have the same goal in mind Amen. and 
I just want to emphasize again, that's so important for churches today. Uh, people come to churches or go to churches, and so often they go with their own agendas. What can I get out of church? What can the church do for me? And the, the, what it ought to be is we ought to be in one accord saying, what can we do for the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ? What is it that we as a church could do? So they were all together in all one accord, and they were in prayer, and they were in supplication. Now, again, that one accord, uh, to narrow it down, it just simply means single-minded. They were there with one purpose. What was that purpose? To seek the Holy Spirit that was to come. And so they spent their time in prayer and in supplication. This word supplication means making a humble petition. To make a humble petition or to plead humbly. And so what do they plead with? Uh, you know, the Lord just said, uh, the, uh, go and wait and the Holy Spirit's going to come. He didn't say that he was going to come on a Thursday at 3 o'clock. That's right. And so what are they doing? They're praying, saying, well, here we are, Lord. We're in one accord and let's let, let's receive the Holy Spirit. We're, we're ready to get this thing going, if you will. But it's the Lord's timing and not their timing. Amen. And another thing I want us to see, or a couple of things, number one, uh, they were told to go and wait, but we see they didn't just go back and hang out. They just go around, sitting around talking, reading the Jerusalem Times, you know, playing Xbox, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. They were busy. Wow. They were spending time in the temple. They were spending time praying, coming together as this group to seek out the Lord. So he said, wait, but wait doesn't mean what we think wait means. We think wait just go and we sit and we wait. Right. But no, they were busy doing and seeking out the Lord again. And so when the Lord tells us to wait, um, again, maybe there's something that you planned on doing one time before and uh, the Lord said, nope, it's not the right time or it just didn't work out. So you said, okay, it must not be the, the time. And so sometimes we just drop it and go on to something else. But no, we need to begin to pray and seek the Lord and say, is this really what I'm supposed to do or is it something else? Right. And so we spend this time doing those things. Another thing that we need to see is that Jesus' mother is there with them. Now notice, she didn't jump up and take charge. They didn't turn to her and say, okay, mother, what are we supposed to do? You see, there are some traditions, there are some churches that would teach that that's what happened, but that's not what happened. They didn't seek her advice. They didn't say, oh, we need to seek you out. She was just there amongst the group in prayer, seeking the Lord's will. Also, we need to understand this is the last mention of her in the Bible. Mm. After this passage of scripture, we hear nothing else about her. Now, if she was supposed to have the importance that some churches teaches that she's supposed to have, why is she not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible? That's right. Why is she mentioned in the epistles? Why do we not see her taking charge? Matter of fact, Jesus, when he was out preaching, uh, um, you know, somebody came up and said, blessed is the, the paps or the breast that fed you. And Jesus said, no, Rather blessed are they that hear my word and obey it. Right. Hear my word and do it. That's the one that's blessed. Remember another time they said, hey, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he says, who are my mother and who are my brothers? Right. And he looked around at the crowd and said, these are my brothers and my sisters. It's this group here. So again, uh, she is there with him. Who else is there with him? Well, there's some other women. We know that Mary Magdalene was probably there and uh, some of the other Marys that were listed, some of the other uh, women uh, that had been following him were there. And also it says his brothers were there. Now his brothers were not the 11 disciples because they've already been mentioned. Right. These are his Brothers, his half-brothers. This is Mary and Joseph's children. These aren't his cousins. That's a different word. These are 
her and Joseph's children, Jesus' half-brothers. Now, we know back in John chapter 7, they didn't believe. Right. Remember, they said, oh, you're, you, you're this great private. If you're, I'm paraphrasing here. You need to go on up and, and show yourself off. And Jesus says, I'm not going that way. That, that's not what I'm here to do, to glorify myself. I'm here to glorify the Father. We noticed too when he was on the cross, there's no mention of them being there. Mary was there. Right. There's no mention of his brothers. But now here they are in the upper room praying. So at some point after his resurrection, they became believers. And that's important. But we also need to understand that Mary didn't remain a virgin, okay? Right. Because she had children. And they were not all immaculately, immaculately conceived. And so we have this group that is gathered here together. And then who takes charge? Peter does. And so verse 15, in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of the names was about 120. So there is 120 people in this upper room. There are 120 people that have been there praying and seeking out the will of God and seeking out the Holy Spirit that is to come. And so we have this group of people now. There's 120 people. Hmm. And we have very little to no information on these people. Mm -hmm. Think about the disciples. Outside of Peter, James, and John, who we know were fishermen, we know Simon the Zealot was a zealot who sought to overthrow Rome and get them out. We know about Mary, Jesus' mother. We know about Mary Magdalene, who, by the way, nowhere in the Bible does it say she was a prostitute. It simply says <coughs> Jesus cast seven demons out of her. Right. Um, when all this mess, you know, that if you saw what was his name, Brown, Dan Brown, you know, he wrote all this stuff about... Um, you know, Jesus and Mary Magdalene getting married and having kids. You know, mm -hmm. that, that he wasn't the first one that came up with that. That stuff goes back into the medieval times. And so what happened? Well, the church created her, started saying that she was a prostitute mm -mm -mm. in order to try to do away with that myth. And we know that the church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene was not. Right. But she wasn't a prostitute either. So we know about them. But the rest of these hundred some odd, we know nothing about them. Absolutely nothing. Other than they were saved. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They believed he was Messiah. And they were up there with the disciples waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. And so that's all we know about these people. And so he begins to speak. Verse 16, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested uh, uh, Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. And so, again, they recognize, if you will, in our modern terminology, Peter has to address Judas Iscariot because that's the elephant in the room, okay? Mm -hmm. Has to address it, has to deal with it. And so he even admits, you know, he had a part in this ministry. Now remember, Jesus said, did I not choose you 12 and one of you is a devil? Mm -hmm. When he sent the 12 out two by two, guess what? Judas Iscariot went out as one of those two that went out among the 12. And what was Judas Iscariot doing? He was given the power, just like the rest of them, to cast out demons and to lay hands on people and to heal them. Right. He experienced all of that stuff. We also know that he was a treasurer and he was a thief and would steal money out of the money bag. So we know all of that. And so we see those things about Jesus. So he had part of the ministry. He was involved in this ministry. And yet we know 
Well, there's speculation. I say we know, but there's some people that say that, you know, he just fell, but he, he repented when he went back and gave the money back, and he's going to be in heaven. But there's no indication of that whatsoever. The indication is he was lost. Right. He is not in heaven right now. He is in hell. Jesus said, woe unto the, you know, I, I'm going to go to the cross, but woe to the one that sends me there if you let me paraphrase. Now, Jesus ain't going to say woe to somebody in heaven that's going to heaven. Mm. And so even David prophesies about this in Psalm 41, 9. It says, yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Mm. And so we see here that even David prophesied of this thing that was to come. And so Judas was a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Remember, Jesus is in the garden. Uh, they come up and Jesus, Judas said, what? The one that I greet with a kiss is going to be the one. The one I greet with a kiss, that will be Jesus. And so we've had part of the ministry. He had all of these things. And for him to have done all of this, all the miracles that he experienced, not just the things he saw Jesus do, but he himself got to do and still did what he did. Kind of hard to believe. And yet how many sit in churches today having seen people that have been healed that were near death, right. having seen the miracles of salvation, still turn a blind eye to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we see that these things happen even today. So he goes on talking about what happened to him. He says, now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his entrails, it's all his guts gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem so that the field is called in their own language, Akedama, that is the field of blood. And so, again, what happens? People see a contradiction here. Let's go back to Matthew 27, verses 3 through 10. It says, Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. And they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Also, we read in Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. It says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. And so again, we see something that happened back then, but was also a prophecy. So what do they call this field? The potter's field. Zechariah says, cast the money to the potter. And so we see the 30 pieces of silver. We see that Judas cast those, gave them back to the chief priest, and then went and hanged himself. And then over here in Acts, it says that he fell and his intestines burst out. We've talked about this before. And people go, oh, see, there's a contradiction. But really, there's no contradiction at all. So he went out, probably tied a rope on a tree and hung himself. And either the limb broke or the rope broke or he hung there for a few days. You know, it was pretty hot and arid out there. And he swole up. And folks, when that happens, it don't take much for you to burst open. Hmm. Trust me, doesn't take much at all. And so he hung himself, and then whatever happened, happened, he fell, and he broke. 
And where did this most likely happen? At this potter's field, which now nobody wants. So the, they said, well, we got this blood money. This guy's hung himself over this field. Hey, let's buy the field, and we will bury transients there. The potter's field, kind of like um, they do today um, with uh, indigent burials. They have places, they have fields set up for people that can't pay uh, or have no family, and they go and they bury them in these indigent fields. So that's pretty much what this became, an indigent field for burial. And so all this fulfills prophecy. He quotes the Psalms in verse 20. Written in the book of Psalms, this is Psalm 69, 25. It says, let their dwelling place be desolate, and let no one live in their tents. Psalm 109, 8, let his days be few, and let another take his office. And so we've got these two different psalms that he's applying to this situation. Now, if you want to read the psalms, you think, well, now, how did Peter get this? How did he get this understanding that these would apply to this situation? Well, it could be that the circumstances in those psalms with those people happen to be the same circumstances that would apply here. But also, we have to remember, and we talked about it last week in Luke 24, 45, that Jesus opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And so... Peter's understanding is that these psalms were fulfilled in this situation. And so now he moves on. Why did he bring up Judas Iscariot? Because he says another needs to take his office. Another needs to take his place. We, uh, uh, Jesus picked 12. There's 11 of us. There needs to be a 12th one. And so verse 21 says, Therefore of these men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So we see the requirements to be an apostle. Now, Paul is a little different because he was called an apostle. And some of the early followers were called apostles. But remember, Paul did see the risen Christ. And Paul says that he was taught by Christ the doctrine that he uh, taught to others. Also, these were called to be apostles to the Jews. And he was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. But the requirements are what? These men who have accompanied us all the time that Jesus was here on earth. From John's baptism to the time that he was taken up that we talked about in the first part of Acts chapter 1 here. And so they had seen the risen Savior. They had been with him and they had walked with him. You see, folks, we got all these people today that call themselves apostles. They ain't. Right. And they say, well, Jesus came and spoke to me. <clears throat> well, we see the requirements. They're saying we need one to take place that was been with us the whole time. So we see that during Jesus' time, there was more than just the 12 that followed him. Of course, as you read through the Gospels, we, we, we get that notion there was times when he just called the 12 away. The 12 would be separate. And then remember, there was three separated from them, Peter, James, and John. And they would be taken off. But again, there were more that followed him during that time. And so, what do they do? They go through a process. Who here has met those requirements? And they propose to, verse 23, Joseph called Marsalis, who is surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, they prayed to the Lord and said, hey, Lord, we're going to do this, but you know men's hearts. It needs to be you that makes a decision. And so then what do they do? They cast lots. And the lot falls on Matthias. Now, if you've read the Old Testament at all, you know they cast lots. How exactly that happened, we don't know. We also know, how many of uh, you remember reading the term in the Old Testament about the Urim and the Thummim? Yeah. Uh, they were two apparent stones that the high priest carried. 
and used to discern God's will. How that worked, nobody really knows. How the casting lots worked. We might think of, uh, you know, sticks or rolling dice. Or how many of you ever had to volunteer for something and they took and somebody took some sticks and broke one off and then they always they said, everybody pick a stick and you got the short stick and yep. you either won or lost depending on what it is you had to do. That would be what a form for us of casting lots. And so they cast lots. But this is the last time in the Bible we read about casting lots. Because that was Old Testament. Now what's going to happen here in a few days? The Holy Spirit's going to come and reside. We don't need to cast lots anymore. Sometimes we still can. We want to cast lots to try to figure out what's going on. But we have the Holy Spirit here. And so they pray and they say, You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen. Now again, this is biblical. Listen to Proverbs 16.33. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Hmm. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So ultimately, when they cast lots and they sought the Lord's will, they said this decision is from the Lord. Now, there's a little bit of controversy here. It's hard to believe there's controversy in the Bible, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah. But there's controversy here because Matthias is never mentioned again in the scripture. Hmm. And so a lot of people go, okay, did they err in doing this at this point in time? Or I mean, was this Peter being Peter? You know, Peter was always the first one to open his mouth. You know, they always say about Peter, open mouth, insert foot. And then sometimes he had to take that foot out to stick the other one in. Hmm. Peter was always jumping, always jumping, always jumping. So they say, well, maybe Peter jumped by doing this instead of waiting because we believe that Paul was actually the 12th disciple. But there's nowhere in the scripture that says that Peter was wrong. And what, as a matter of fact, he quoted scripture to justify the reason he was doing what he was doing. And the reason they, and, and we don't have anything, remember they're all of one accord. We don't have anybody standing up going, eh, I think we ought to wait, Peter. Hmm. They were all in agreement they needed to do this thing. And so just because Matthias is never mentioned again doesn't mean that he didn't go out and witness and do all the things that the other disciples did. Because when we get into the book of Acts, we have a few people, but who's the primary people that it's talking about? Peter, and then Paul. I mean, they're the two ones that Acts is focused on. Now, of course, we have Stephen, and we have Silas, and we have Mark, and, you know, there are names of some others mentioned, but for the most part, it's Peter and Paul. And that's what the book's focused on. Matter of fact, there's a legend that Matthias actually was martyred in Ethiopia. Hmm. And so he just becomes one of these 120. His name's mentioned here, but the things that he did, we have no record of. The things of the rest of these 120 here, we have no record of. But they were there when 3,000 got saved in chapter 2. Hmm. They probably all helped baptize them. They were some of these that scattered and went out when the persecution came and began to spread the message. So we see that even though they're no longer mentioned, it doesn't mean that they weren't important. Look at it this way. How many of you think in the Sudan, there's Christians over there that know our names? Ain't got a clue. And we don't know who they are. That doesn't mean they're not doing great things. Right. That doesn't mean that they're not witnessing the people about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. And accomplishing what the Lord had them to do, just as they here are accomplishing what the Lord had them to do. Our name doesn't have to be in the only book our name needs to be in book is the in book is the Lamb's Book of Life. Right. right. That's the only book we need to worry about. 
Everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame. See all these people on, you know. All we need is the Lamb's Book of Life. As long, long as our name's written in there, we're good. That's right. The rest of it doesn't matter. And so what are we seeing? We're starting to see the coming together of this group that the Lord is getting ready to use to expand his church so they can grow in number and begin to what? Spread out and do what he told them to do back in verse 8. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, he could have done that with just 12. It would have taken a little longer, but you got 120 that becomes 3,000, that becomes 8,000, because 5,000 are added a day or two later. And then again, what happens? They spread. That's right. The word spreads. And it spreads and it grows. To what it is today where there's millions of Christians on the earth today. And it all started in this upper room, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk about next week. But now imagine if they got ahead of the Lord and said, I know he said, wait for the Holy Spirit. But, man, that was some cool stuff we saw. We need to go tell somebody. They do like we can do sometimes and not carefully get ahead of God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we get ahead of God and we get ourselves in trouble and God says, no, you need to wait on me. And so that's what they had to do and that's what we see that they did do. They waited for the coming of the Holy Spirit, and we'll start talking about that next week. All right? All right. God bless you. Thank you so much. Let's take a little prayer.